Hello, everyone. Uh, this is a tale of two workflows. I am your storyteller, uh, Pete Cheslock. You can find me on Twitter. I don't think Dickens had Twitter, but I do. So it was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. The age of wisdom. I hope my gifts are animating, otherwise this talk will suck. Uh, and there were some, definitely some, some good ideas. It was the age of foolishness. This might, this might age me, actually. This is old, back to Wayne's Brothers. We had some not-so-good ideas, uh, many of which I'm going to share with you today. Uh, that's pretty much where the Dickens ends, because trying to get a talk to look like Dickens is like impossible. So anyway, uh, I'm Pete Cheslock. I currently work at Dyn. Any, who's here as a Dyn customer? Uh, Dyn, Dynamic DNS. Uh, all right, so for those of you that may not know, uh, uh, Dyn DNS, uh, traffic management, DNS, email, message management. Uh, I got, I've got the throwback logo up there. Um, that's the old school Dyn DNS logo. Uh, previously, I had a company called Sonian. Uh, it was an email archiving company. One of the really early uh, ops code, sorry, Chef customers. We were definitely one of the earliest on um, hosted uh, Chef because uh, it, we would break it often because we would just push too much traffic to it. Uh, anyone here heard of Sensu? Uh, so Sensu came, you know, probably more people have heard of Sensu than Chef, or than um, so, uh, Sonian, but uh, Sensu came out of, of that company uh, while I was there. So uh, I always like to have a disclaimer because I'm going to talk about two specific different workflows at two different companies. So the real companies, real workflows, really bad or good choices, depending on your viewpoint. Um, and so you shouldn't attempt these at all. I might anger people. That's cool. If you need a hug, I'm here. I like hugs. Um, and I'll give you a hug afterwards if I, if I upset you. My double disclaimer is, for all the love of DevOps, please, 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 don't uh, just don't cargo cult this. Don't just take it, kind of blindly imply it to your infrastructure, because the things will go badly. So uh, I think there's bits and pieces that might be interesting to everyone here. Um, and I think the biggest part of this talk is talking about the, the, um, the cultures within those companies that kind of brought about these workflows. Because I think that's the biggest part, is my culture is different than yours, and my infrastructure is different than yours. Um, so the way in which we use those tools are going to be a lot different. So what am I going to do here today? Uh, we're going to talk about uh, basically four plus years of Chef, my time with Chef. Uh, and a lot has changed over that time. And when we started with Chef, there was no roles, for example, or I don't think there were data bags at the time. Um, so we're going to talk about these two specific companies, um, tools we used, uh, tools we built, um, the requirements we worked with, and then basically how things turned out um, and what we learned. So now, <clears throat> we did some weird stuff. We did some crazy stuff. Uh, there were reasons. There's always reasons why we do the things we do. Uh, but I think the key thing is how you use Chef is dependent on your workflow and your infrastructure. I would bet everyone here probably uses it slightly differently, which is great. That's why we like Chef. So, uh, but what I'm going to do is try to point, uh, do my best at least, to point out places where um, our design decisions were actually based on uh, biases of the organization and the culture behind it there. So biases, they rule everything around me. <clears throat> so Chef is, uh, I guess the best part about Chef is it's extremely flexible and allows you to do pretty much anything you want. And then the worst part about Chef is it's extremely flexible and allows you to do pretty much anything you want. So I see on the mailing list and IRC and everywhere else, everyone's like, how do I get started? What do I do? Um, you know, where do you even start? And as a new user, it's fairly overwhelming, right? So you know, roles good, bad, I don't even know. Hopefully the animation's popping up. OK, cool. Um, and you know, when I started at Dyn, you know, I, a lot of people I never use Chef. They're not Rubyists. You know, C, C++ programmers, and so you know, you kind of telling them all these cool new things, and and um, it can be just a lot to kind of take in. So um, you know, we're all using Chef because we don't want the tool to dictate the usage. We want something flexible. Uh, John Cowie, I don't know if anyone you, uh, went to his talk. He said it before. Basically, like the whole purpose of Chef is that you know, instead of building Chef to like keep up with infrastructure, it wanted to be modular and plug uh, you know pluggable so that it can be flexible for uh, essentially all of our uses. So. Basically, like where you know where you start, um, you got these cookbooks now. Now, what do you do? So you pick your poison, right? You want one big ass repo with all your cookbooks in it. Not that that's a bad thing. Do you want one repo per cookbook? Uh, how do you manage your versions? How do you manage your dependencies? Um, the key thing that I'll say is your success with Chef is not determined by this decision point because hopefully, no matter what you do, you're going to change it in the future. Like you're going to want to improve upon your workflow um, as your uh, organization matures. So. First company up, Sonian, uh, founded 2008, or maybe a little earlier. My dates might be wrong. They were early AWS user. Uh, they were a startup challenge finalist. I joined in 09. Again, early Chef user. They were originally Puppet, because it was before Chef. 
uh, but then moved to Chef. Um, and uh, massive growth, uh, growth over the time that I was there uh, from you know, dozens of servers to thousands, uh, from just AWS to multiple public clouds. Um, and so the automation of all those systems was like really critical for us because you know, deploying to HP Cloud, deploying to Rackspace Cloud or EC2 or wherever we had to um, you know, was uh, difficult. So you know, automation was key. We're spinning up and spinning down systems all the time. Um, so how do we manage those systems, right? You got fork this repo. This is how you get started. So we'd have like our um, you know, knife RB driven by environment variables for every, everyone to use, cookbooks, data bags, environments. We would put libraries in here, like helper libraries, binary scripts, like whatever we could shove in here. Knife plugins. We didn't ship knife plugins via gems. Uh, we just shoved them in here because it works that way. Um, and you know, we used this, and it worked you know, for quite a while without any kind of major issues, but you know, a few misfires along the way. The communication uh, at Sonian was pretty high. We had a remote team. Uh, so people uh, would chat over you know, IRC or whatever. And you know, communication, like I said, was, was high because that was like forwarding everything into that one place. So, but you know, business starts picking up uh, very quickly. Speed picks up, the velocity. You have to make concessions. Like, who here has worked for a, uh, a company that has been moving basically so fast that you're like, I could do A or B, and which one's fastest, right? You know, there's pretty much most people here. So you have to make concessions, and you just have to get things done for the most part. So speed picked up, and mistakes were made. You know, another interesting thing at Sony, and it's an email archiving product, um, and when you sell larger deals of email archiving, um, there's contracts that come in, and they'll say kind of crazy things like, you can only deploy to this SaaS product at these specific times. So our you know, speed of deploying was we could only deploy as fast as basically the whatever contract was like most restrictive. So I'll talk more about that a little bit later. But for the most part, what it looked like in kind of the earlier days, You'd have your chef repo, maybe you'd have a, a tagged release, or you'd be off master or something like that. Maybe you have three customers. The way we broke out our customers was via these different environments, chef environments, different stacks, full kind of full stacks for different large customers. Maybe one customer's running off of head, maybe one's a few commits back. And you know, it works, right? You know, people know where they have to be to do knife cookbook upload A or whatever your running commands are, right? But then, you know, this happens, right? And you get completely screwed because something changed. Someone pushed some code to a different environment at a different ref, and now like nothing works, right? Um, so we had to keep, uh, and we ran all these different stacks and environments because uh, data keeping you know data separate, whatever. So someone pushes a change, maybe they don't notice that they uploaded to the wrong environment, which happened often, and now things are broken, and you're looking everywhere. It completely sucks, and it's painful. It hurts a lot. Um, so now imagine that environment with 20 plus, or imagine that scenario. I should say with 20 plus environments. Um, each one living in multiple public clouds. Uh, each one has a different contracted deployment schedule. Some we could deploy every day. Some we could deploy to like every three weeks or every two weeks. Um, and some of you might say, well, a system change, that's not a deploy. I'm not changing code. I'm like, well, then you should be a lawyer because my lawyer is different on that one. So how does this really work in, in, in practice? Basically, we just push a small change to production. This is before we create any sort of workflow. We'd push like a minor change, and then everything would break terribly. Um, because we were basically pushing the infrastructure much, much harder and faster than, than we really should have. Uh, it, it was a lot of technical debt from growing so quickly that even the, the minor things would, would kind of um, get us later. Uh, and then, you know, this is email archiving, so you know, we really need to be up all the time. Customers are sending us their email, you know, we're you know, holding on to that data. Uh, we can't drop that data because uh, lawyers get really upset when they're being sued and they're trying to find that you know, piece of, of evidence in their email. So we have to ensure that the changes we're pushing aren't going to horribly kind of break everything. So um, this was uh, 2011, I think, at the time. So there was no librarian. There was no Burks. Um, we needed a way to control the branches of code that were going to get deployed out to these systems. Um, you know, so for our deployment, it was kind of like creating uh, every story, like a Jira story or something, would have a branch. And we wanted to get into this cycle of you know, uh, uh, you know, branch, commit, merge, test, over and over and over and over. And we were focusing on pre-production first as a way to um, basically test this stuff out before we kind of did it with production. So it kind of looked like this. So head on master is what we consider done code. And again, we're talking one giant repo of every asset in there, so roles and data bags and whatever else. And so this is code that has gone through uh, QA regression testing. Um, it's system changes and application code, because in Chef, we would say, like, deploy this version of the application. 
Um, but it's, it's all gone through like QA and whatever. So all the branches would essentially get cut from here. So, um, so basically, like a new branch, uh, basically how it would work is branch gets cut from master, developer does their commits. Uh, developer then merges their stuff into dev, which will upload it to the dev stack. Uh, if they, you know, things didn't break, they merge into QA. Then if it goes through regression testing by an actual team of people, um, then we merge it into master. So, you know, it was basically this workflow that allowed us to start ensuring that uh, roles, data bags, environments, cookbooks, and application code kind of moved together from dev to QA. We actually had a UA, a user acceptance stack as well. Um, and then we would even keep doing that on the, on the way out to production. So like low risk stacks and high risk stacks, things like that. So who here loves roles? That's it? Like three people? Who here hates roles then? Who's indifferent on roles? I just want to get people to raise their hands, come on. So um, production was a bit more complex because we use roles a lot. Again, this is a long time ago. We didn't have people saying, well, we didn't have Berkshelf. We didn't have a lot of this stuff. Roles are and are still, I, I, I believe, are a great thing. Uh, used for specific reasons. Um, and I'm going to completely contradict myself later on in this talk, just so you know. Um, so we use roles a lot. We would use roles to say what you are. So a role is what you are, like this stack, and maybe you have a base role, and then a non-prod, or a prod role, or which cloud you're in, application level roles. And we would do stupid things like put the version of code to deploy in the role. Well, so And roles, as you know, are global objects. If you change a role, it's going to go everywhere. And you know, that's bad, but we were basically role dependent. So, you know, you might have someone say something like, hey, just let me just put this small change to one role, and then, you know, the inevitable happens is that uh, everything breaks terribly with this one little minor change that went out. So, we got burned all the time, uh, and it, uh, instead of like move fast and break things, we moved fast and broke, you know, broke everything. So, we needed something that, um, again, 2011 or so, uh, we need something that could kind of work for today, maybe be flexible enough for the future. And so we're like, yeah, let's create a Git branching strategy. And so a lot of people might be like, oh, like why would you ever do that, right? Because it's not that good of an idea, I guess. Um, so here's the question we were trying to answer. And we, we thought uh, at the time that this, this was basically the way to do it. Um, and I'd love to chat with anyone on you know, how you guys manage this stuff uh, because, uh, again, we're all doing different things. But we want to answer the question is, how do you version cookbooks roles, data bags, and your application code, because if your role says deploy X version, as essentially like one bundle of assets, like code assets to deploy. Um, and since essentially all that data was in the Chef repo, we said, well, we can just use um, Git reference points to say this is the version of the, the whole environment. Um, so what does that look like? So before we talked about all the code gets tested in QA, it goes through that cycle of to a dev stack, to a QA stack, regression tested by humans, and they make sure everything's good to go. Um, so master, uh, the head on master basically, uh, what would happen is, is during a deploy, because master is the done code as we know, we would cut some branches. Uh, we'd cut a release branch, and we'd cut a base tag. So as you know, you can't commit to tags, and so that's basically the starting point. So why would we create a tag? It's basically because uh, code is going to be coming from QA. So master's moving forward. It keeps moving forward. And we want to deploy a stack at a, basically a point in time. So we would have a tag, in this case, release 2011.701. There is website code has the same version name. And there's backend code that has the same version name. So um, the next step would be is, so let's say I want to patch an environment on this, this release. How do I do that? I can't cut a branch from master because I'm going to pull in like a ton of upstream changes. So that's where that base tag comes in. So if you're an engineer, you would check out a branch from the base tag and then merge it into the release branch. And then if you want it to move forward, you're going to move it to master and be done with it. So uh, the next step is another release, right? So we do the base tag and we do the release tag. And uh, the environment would basically get uploaded from the section. And it would operate in the same fashion. Uh, after this, uh, we might have these individual commits that we would do, so things that are too lightweight for a branch, even though it's Git, so branches have no cost. But um, like, I want to just push a singular, like, change one file. We might just do a single commit. And then we'll just cherry pick those forward using Git commands. Um, and then lastly, which is if you like, do crazy Git foo, um, we might accidentally or on purpose create a branch off of master, but then realize it needs to go back to an old release. Uh, so we would then rebase it on like an old tag and then squash merge because we had people who really wanted the Git tree to be pretty. So you're probably thinking this, right? That sounds really complex. Who thinks that sounds really complex? Hopefully everyone raises their hand. It was, but 
we had some Git experts on the team, and we had a lot of tooling around the branching strategy. But I think more than that is, again, as we talk about the chef code and the systems code and the application code kind of all living together, what we were really doing is like we were release engineering, right? So we had a branching strategy, and we had tagging, and we had packaging, right? And we had all these different ways that we kind of control it. And I'm sure real, real release engineers would tell me I'm cl completely wrong, because I probably am. So. But at the time, you got to remember, again, there was no Berk shelf, and I wish there was. And some people were using Git sub modules, which I would never, ever touch for this scenario. Um, but you know, it's, it, it was overly complex, but the tooling really helped us here. So we actually built a tool to assist us with this called uh, Misen Plus. Uh, and what it was is when you wanted to actually push code to a stack, so let's say you're in that release 8.1, whatever, and you want to push to a stack, you would uh, push to this, you know, git push, mis, whatever. And um, you're basically pushing a reference point and saying, hey, push all the code from here up to the stack. And um, the cool thing <coughs> on mis and what it would do is, uh, and I don't know how the text looks on here, if it's easy to see, but basically in the middle section there, you see like ref points from like old to new. So when someone pushes it, you click on that. And if I was smart in advance, I would have shown you what that looks like. But when you click on that, it'll show you an actual git diff of like, here's the files that are changing. So what this basically allowed us to do is to say things like, who pushed what and when did they push it? Um, there was no more concept of something changed, like things broken and we don't know what changed. Um, I think I thought about it at the time, but I never actually did it. I figured I'd piss off everyone on my team. But I was actually going to remove everyone's upload privileges to the Chef server and just have us push to here. If I was smart, I would have done it, and I just I probably got lazy or something. Um, but the concept here is that we're pushing to, in this, this environment, you'll see there's a lot of like pre-production stacks that we had. And so if you're a normal engineer and you want to push a new release of chef code out, you'd push to this and it would upload it. But if you push to a protected stack, and that was any stack that was pretty much production, then you had a concept of an approval process. And the approval process is someone else logs in and they click the little button that says approve. And hopefully it's something like this for more games where, you know, before launching those nuclear missiles, they're, you know, turn your key, sir. So two people would have to look at that code and hopefully agree upon it. Now, the other way I looked at it, too, was it was a way to kind of slow, you know, kind of slow the roll down a bit on a deploy. Because if someone pushes the code and you approve it and it breaks, it's not their fault. It's your fault. Why did you approve it? Did you look at it? Now, if you, you know, looked at it and missed something, no big deal. But um, we were trying to basically push, push that one. So, so what happened, right? We kind of had no process, no workflow to a workflow. So it seems like it would work. You know, it would actually work. Not only did it work, but it worked really well. Um, and to give you kind of a concept of our, how we deployed code, like chef code, and again, chef and application lives together, um, we had, this would be what we called deploy week, uh, 20 stacks of 20 separate customer environments. We'd upgrade about four per night. It would go from like 6 p.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, if you were lucky, sometimes you weren't, and it went much later, um, in, even into the morning in some cases. Our deployment schedule was such that uh, we would develop for two weeks, we would um, test for one week, and then we'd deploy. So every three weeks you're doing this. Every three weeks you're doing a, you're burning a week of deploy. Uh, it's it's painful. So that was before, uh, well before deploy week, we just deployed all the time. Uh, I always make the joke of like, is it still continuous deployment if you just log in all your servers and change shit? Um, if so, we were continuously deploying like seriously. Um, so let's see, over the course of about 12 months, as we instituted this process and started going, going through it, again, we started off and it was deploy whenever, continuously, right? Continuous deployment. Things break randomly because there was a little testing and not really much planning. We created this like multi-page checklist for the deploy, and it was like mostly manual stuff. The beauty of that manual checklist was that was all the stuff we automated in the next sprint. So over time, it was like massive checklist getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, smaller. So again, deploy week, ton of, ton of uh, stacks over many days, and hopefully you could get it done in a few hours, to what we call deploy day, which was we would do all of them in that kind of one night time, maybe about three hours or so. And then um, contracts, reasons, and stuff, we actually moved deploy day to a Saturday. And uh, by last, at least when I was still there, we got it down to just about an hour. So I mean, this is a massive improvement. And even though, the, so the rule that we basically had for deploy day was if you worked, like if you did a deployment on a Saturday, you just took another day off. So, you know, it was great when you could get it, like you were getting those tools better to make those deploys faster uh, and safer, hopefully. So, you know, if you spent an hour on a deploy on a Saturday and you take eight hours off on a Monday, which is kind of nice. 
So uh, things got better, and the key thing was uh, deploys were drama free. We knew exactly what we were deploying. It had gone through all these levels of testing. Now, granted, things happen from time to time and whatever, but uh, all the pieces moved together. They all changed at the same time. We treated data bags, roles, cookbooks, et cetera, all together. And we even got to the point where, uh, as we got better at it and faster, then we spent the time that we were investing on you know, a week of deploys into actually making the tooling better so that the support team would do the deploys or other teams would do the deploys. Um, and really, like high communication as this was happening uh, really allowed this to work. So you know, that's pretty much like DevOps, right? High communication, tight feedback, loops, um, woo, DevOps. So um, I'm going to ask this question. How many people here maybe think about from time to time what it would be like to have a, a greenfield opportunity with really anything? But it could be Chef. Like you're like mired with your normal stuff. <laughs> I'll get this back. Um, so of course, you know, you think about that. Like, what if I could walk into a place and I mean everything that I currently know and um, do it completely differently? What would you do? So, enter Dyn. Uh, again, for those of you who don't know, uh, don't know or incorporated in 2001, we do traffic management, message management. And uh, I joined early uh, last year uh, to run system automation and release engineering for them. We may or may not have called that team the DevTools, uh, the DevOps team, until people made fun of me for it, rightfully so. We now call it the DevTools team, which sounds much better. And uh, we stole that title from Etsy, so thanks for that. When, uh, when I started there, I had, like, during the interview process, and I think sometimes during the interview, companies will tell you one story, and it sounds really nice, and it's like, oh, it's a beautiful green field. And go out and change the world. Uh, you know, this beautiful thing, no, no historical biases, right? There's no technical debt. Look at that. It's gorgeous. And yeah, that's Windows. There was no Windows, so uh, I just thought it was pretty. Um, and so I thought, like, this would be a great opportunity. I can invest re investigate requirements, try different things out, and just see what happens. But, you know, when it comes to technical debt, like, there is always technical debt. Um, so a little story about Dyn. So, you know, we were probably a 50-person, under 50-person company until about 2008, 2009. From then until now, we have about 300 employees. So we've had massive growth. Um, our customers have grown uh, you know, massively. It's just growth in every possible place. Uh, we had in maybe 2006 to 2008, we probably had five sites. We now have over 20 sites for you know, our DNS and email traffic management products. So uh, basically, like high growth, high speed, so you have to make concessions. And when you make concessions, you incur technical debt. Um, but I will say I was never surprised by anything I saw. It's very common to see a lot of these um, you know, concessions made during the time. So no big deal. But as I looked to my greenfield, I looked out and I saw something in the distance. I didn't know what that was. There were these silos that were out there, beautiful shiny silos. So uh, when I first started, I started going to the different teams and I started getting to know, you know what they were doing. So I go to the operations team and I say, hey, you know, what are you using for config management? Oh, we're using CF Engine. I'm like, all right, you know, sounds good. Uh, you know, is it working? You know, do you like it? Yeah, yeah, it works for us. You know, it does solve this problem. Awesome. Go to one of the engineering teams. Hey, what, uh, what are you using for config management? Oh, we've got everything deployed with Chef. It's awesome. I'm like, oh, really? Is that out in production? No, no, we can't get it to the operations team because they use CF Engine. Okay. Go to another engineering team. I shit you not. Hey, we're going to, you know, we're going to look into Chef, but it seems too hard, so we're going to try Puppet. <laughs> and the last one, NAH, uh, not invented here syndrome. Uh, Dyn's been around longer than a lot of these config managements, so they built their own that do kind of similar things. So I got all these beautiful silos. So what did Nathan teach us earlier? Like, how do we deal with silos, right? Blow those suckers up. Um, and I just had to get that gif of his, like, creepy little ding. <laughs> so we got to break down the silos. So needless to say, when I started there, um, you know, there was a lot on my plate. Um, the biggest thing on my plate wasn't that delicious burrito. <sighs> It was to pick a single CM solution and standardize upon it. So to pick a single CM solution at a place that has no config management, pretty easy, right? To pick a single CM solution at a place that is using all of them is slightly different. Like, everyone's not going to be happy with that decision. So I can say that I picked Chef because uh, one of the teams had most of the stuff done in Chef, but, you know, I love Chef, so that's why. <laughs> I'm the boss. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but no, there was... Uh, uh, there's a lot of reasons that I don't really want to go into because I'm sure you've heard it all week or you know a few days from this one. But I will say that uh, when it comes to the interesting thing about the different silos, right? So um, when everyone's using the same tools and you know you're talking the same language, right? You know 
one team had fully deployed their app in pre-production, not in production, because this was Chef and this was CF Engine, and they don't talk to each other. So we had to increase the communication and how we do that by using the same tools, right? Um, so the other thing is uh, we have a lot of engineers, and there's a lot of scenarios where an engineer that I may not talk to and may not interact with could just kind of come to us and say, we have this cookbook and we want to deploy it. Um, and so we wanted a like brain dead, easy solution for a CI pipeline. Like literally, code goes in, code comes out. Um, you don't have to know a lot about kind of the underlying stuff of what's happening, and I'll talk in depth about what we actually what that really looks like. But the key thing is that if you're a developer, you're not a chef subject matter expert, and you don't have to be. Um, you know, you write a cookbook, and we basically tell all of our developers if you write an app, you you know, you got to bring the cookbook with it. Um, and so they bring it together and uh, just kind of drop it in the pipeline, and uh, yeah, and it started working well. So, so. There's some hard challenges when it comes to uh, um, the service that we provide. So one of our largest services is enterprise DNS and traffic management service. So uh, you know everything is a DNS problem, as everyone reminds me whenever something breaks, and they always joke and like, "Ah, Pete, everything's a DNS problem." So it's really frightening to make changes. It really scare. It's scary. Now, if you have lots and lots of testing, it's not scary. So we're trying. That's where we want to get to. But when you have a massive chunk of the internet. That is depending on you to be running. It's it's scary, um, and it's obviously got to be running all the time. So <clears throat> we have to do this workflow, uh, and we have to be able to be able to push automation without breaking everything. So uh, this is uh, animated GIF. Uh, this is BGP monitor watching as routes are getting withdrawn from a bunch of routers. I'm not going to say whose company it is. It doesn't matter at all. But this was an eye opener for me when this incident occurred because basically what happened was it was an automated change to a bunch of routers. That caused the router to lock up due to a bug in the router software because bugs happen. So uh, this caused a massive uh, outage in like global internet services. So we had to build in necessary gates and levers uh, and have a lot of controlled deploy options. So earlier in the talk, when I said I'll always kind of point out the reasons why we made the choices we did, literally this is the reason why. I don't want to be that person. Like this scares me for something like this to happen. So um, this was like a 30-minute outage, uh, you know, kind of global internet. So people are like, well, what's the scope? Like, how bad are you talking, right? Like, how bad really would this be? So um, what's like the first thing you do when something uh, breaks, right? You go immediately to Twitter, immediately, and you about it on Twitter. Because they're listening to you, man. They're totally listening. Well, yeah, that's not going to work because Twitter's going to go down. So all right, no big deal. I want to buy some beautifully crocheted awesomeness from Etsy. Nope. Uh, I need to find some animated GIFs for my awesome PowerPoint. That's going down. I might need to listen to music because I'm kind of depressed at this point. That's not going to work. Um, I might actually want to get work done, as odd as that may seem, but that's not going to work. And then there's you know, these two sites, which have a fair amount of traffic that also go through them that they depend on us. And so yeah, that's pretty much it as well. So the scope is massive. And we are stewards of our customer traffic. So we really take this. Seriously, I mean, we are very cautious people because if I have a bad day, you all have a really bad day, and that would be um, that would be pretty bad. So this is again the scope of of the impact of how we push our our changes are, is the reason this whole workflow exists. So uh, some of the initial challenges we have a lot of FreeBSD. Any FreeBSD fans in here? All right, good stuff. Uh, are you also using Chef on FreeBSD? You will soon. Let me show you more. So another thing, change is hard to unknown systems. So we have a lot of systems that have been out there for a while, varying states of config. We need to bring them into kind of a single state of configuration. Um, <clears throat> so the other part, too, is uh, when you deploy to unknown systems, you, know, you bring in dependencies. And I don't want dependencies, because dependencies mean things that I may not have tested getting under the systems. And so I don't know what it would be like. I don't even know if you can install Chef from ports. Probably it's old version. But it would probably look something like this. <laughs> Uh, because it's going to pull in a ton of stuff, and I, I mean, I'm sure I'm not, I don't really know FreeBSD that well, but I'm sure, assuming there's better ways to figure that one out. But the key thing is that I don't want external dependencies. So, enter the Omnibus. Uh, who here uses, well, I guess, who here uses the Omnibus client for Chef? I think it's pretty much everyone at this point, right? Uh, does anyone use Omnibus for other packages um, other than just Chef? Like, build their own Omnibus packages. So, a few people, cool. So if you don't know what Omnibus is, it's basically like the giant kitchen sink of code. So it's uh, in the Chef example, it's going to compile Ruby, all the Ruby dependencies, all the gems, and it's going to put it in one big bundle, and it's going to put it in opt whatever. So 
We love Omnibus. We have FreeBSD, but we also have other um, OSs out there. And having a single package kind of built from the same source that works across platforms is, is a huge win for us. So uh, <clears throat> awesome work in the community. Uh, Scott Sanders, uh, who works at GitHub now, wrote the initial proof of concept to get an Omnibus to build on FreeBSD. Brian McClellan, who was here somewhere, but uh, he helped and worked with me to actually get uh, our code and build up into upstream. And uh, Seth Chismore and a ton of pe other people from Opscode. It's like straight up, this is like community awesomeness. They had no financial obligation to support FreeBSD, and it's like supported like that. But um, it's there. Like you can curl bash it and, and um, you know, download it. So if you are using FreeBSD, if you're using FreeBSD 9, because that's, that's all we have up there so far, you can grab the Omnibus client. It totally works. Um, and it's generally awesome. So FreeBSD is problem solved. Cool. We start deploying Chef to the nodes. We create a base role. Um, and because, you know, roles, like last talk, right? Roles are totally cool. We're going to create a base role. And it's just going to have a run list of items. So I did learn my lesson from the last place to not put a ton of the attributes on your roles because that will screw you over later. But just to have a run list, something simple. A role is what you are, and the run list is what you do. Uh, about a month or so later, we wanted to change the run list. And now we're in a situation where we have a global object that if we change one thing, it changes everywhere. And that is scary. So we basically do like a wrapper cookbook for a roll. It's a roll cookbook. And it kind of looks like this. You just add a bunch of include recipes. Um, we'll also might set and override attributes here um, uh, for depending on environments or, or whatnot. But I guess the real bonus here, uh, how many test kitchen users in the room? Cool. So um, the real bonus to this one is any person can clone a roll uh, cookbook and basically run a test kitchen against it with the different suites. Because again, we have different OSs out in play. Um, and also uh, have all the server spec testing along with it. So that way you can basically say, you know, I want to make a change to this role, server spec, spin it up, it does all its fun stuff, and it runs a server spec, uh, sorry, test kitchen spins it up, runs a server spec test at the end, and um, you don't have to deal with like roles, because like where are your roles? Uh, if you don't have a chef repo, right? They're somewhere else and you'd have to pull them in. So now I'm not going to get into roles uh, versus no roles at all, because this is pretty much the only outcome, right? Um, you're either pro-role or anti-role, and I kind of fall in the middle somewhere. So in this case, I'd get killed by these people. But um, So I love roles. I really do. And I think you can be really successful with roles. Um, but again, my infrastructure is different than your infrastructure, than yours, and yours, and yours. So, um, you know, so we just don't use them. Now, our pipeline supports roles, and someone could actually, like, you know, send us roles into the pipeline, and we'd be good to go. But we just pretty much don't tell, we just don't tell people we have roles. They don't know they exist. So uh, we do wrapper recipes. We, we run um, the community cookbooks, and we just wrap on top of it. We really like that model because it's pretty much the same as our wrapper roll. So like our Dine CI recipe, anything that's a wrapper is just Dine underscore the thing. So when Jenkins did a big refactor from 1.0 to 2.0, all we do is we, we just refactor our wrapper and set the metadata with the version correctly, and good to go. So another interesting bit is something we talk about a lot internally at Dine is, is this circular dependency. Um, and I always thought it was kind of a cop-out for like, well, we don't want to do that. We don't want to use this hosted service because circular dependency. And I just thought it was a cop-out. But um, what it basically means is, as I showed in the scope of bad slide, is we run DNS uh, and traffic for a lot, of, a lot of customers. Opscode slash chef is one of our customers. So we noticed when we were basically using the chef full template <coughs> to bootstrap a node that you're hitting, you know, you curl bashing from the Opscode site, right? So we never want to be in a situation where if we're having a major issue, we can't get to the thing to get the thing down because we're having an issue and again circular dependency. So uh, so again we start storing these omnibus uh, you know client packages locally. But then we started like digging into it a bit, which is super dangerous to do because you find a lot of stuff. So where are the community cookbooks stored? They're on GitHub. Where are and community.opsco.com and who does their DNS, right? So we uh, basically created an organization. It's called our cookbook repo on our Chef server because again we don't use hosted Chef, right? You gotta buy enterprise Chef or open source, I guess. Uh, but anyway, we create a repo, and we uh, grab the community cookbooks, and we just shove them in there. So that's what we did initially. We actually then moved into GitHub Enterprise just for visibility reasons. So it really allowed anyone to see what cookbooks were there. But it also, we like, would run short-term forks. So while we were waiting for an upstream change, we would just run like, our local fork version. But we really, the rule was like, try not to edit them too much, uh, just because like, just use the wrapper recipe to do a lot of your editing. Um, so we want to remove the humans from the equation, because humans make bad decisions. And granted, like humans are going to write the things that are going to do this stuff. But 
So we want testing, and we want testing like as a first class citizen. And I, I said to myself that if I force testing as a requirement or just stress it really early, then people won't know there's another option. And like a lot of the developers, like they don't know that they shouldn't ship their cookbook with tests. And it's awesome because they ship their cookbook with tests. Um, so we use food critics, chef spec, RuboCop, service spec, all during the chef run. It's all automated process. Um, anyone here use Thor SEM version? Yeah, it's, if you haven't used this, uh, Riot Games, I think, created this one. Basically, this automates our versioning and get tagging. So humans don't touch the version numbers. Uh, they basically tell uh, what cookbooks to update based on the commit messages. So I'll show you what that looks like. So this is a little snippet of our uh, Jenkins run. Uh, chef, uh, uh, chef spec completes successfully. So it's going to basically tag a version, which is a tag in Git, which is nice. And it will then uh, upload it to our cookbook repo using a uh, Burke shelf. So make sure we grab that cookbook and all of its dependencies and put them on the cookbook. Now, if you uh, patch is default for us, if you want a minor or a major, you just do like hashtag minor or major in your commit message. So, so we're trying to speed up the iteration to master. And uh, for a developer, it's you know cut a branch, make changes, test, go to Jenkins, and then get it to master. Master for us is not production. Where these are two totally separate things. We've separated development and deployment uh, in two totally separate bundles. And so development's happening at this incredibly fast rate. And deployment's happening just a little bit slower because, again, bad things happen when you move too fast. Uh, so how does this work for us pretty well so far? As the DevTools team, we've kind of evangelized Chef internally. So we're the product owner. People ask us questions. Uh, they come into our chat rooms, and we help them out. Uh, we give training. We give mentoring. We bring Chef in, Ops Code in, to do training themselves. And you know, uh, the key thing is that we're, we're, we're not PR, like you know, code reviewing people's cookbooks because I'm not the app owner. I'm not going to say how the cookbook should be written. Um, it's basically trying to enforce it via Jenkins. So if there's like a custom food critic rule that we want to say, don't use this like chef primitive, we could put it there and enforce it. So like I said before, like this is awesome, right? Cookbooks came to me with tests. That's like, that blows my mind in an awesome way. Test Kitchen and Burke Shelf, we use that all for local development. Uh, obviously, we're using. Uh, we were using Burks 2 because Burks 3 was not released yet. So because of that, we use Burks 2. There's no site. We don't have site ops code. We don't use ops code because we do whatever circular dependency. So we created a simple API. If you're still on Burks 2 and you're not upgrading, which would be silly because Burks 3 works and it has an API. So this is pretty much kind of going away. But uh, we have an API. We point Burks 2 to it to all of our vendor cookbooks. So. The real trick is how do you get this stuff out to production? So we've, we might need to push to a single node in one site, a single node in many sites, single node in every site, single node in region. I mean, it's like every possible deploy scenario because again, we need to be very pur purposeful how we ship code so we don't, you know, basically like uh, break the internet. Um, so what we do is we represent uh, a, a chef organization in Git using the Burks file as a single source of truth. So as you can see in this, as an example, here's a bunch of cookbooks with version lock equals. And uh, Jenkins will basically take this file, and it will do the dependency solve, and we create an um, you know, environment locks out of that. So we want this to say like, what, it should, what uh, you know, production should look like, these versions of cookbooks. So I had said we, use, we don't use roles because they're global objects that can't be versioned. Uh, we have Thor SCM that auto bumps the cookbooks. And then uh, we know that we want to run a node in production in an environment with version locks. And we want those environments to be kind of uh, created in an automated fashion and not touched by human hands, right? They're immutable environments that get created and upload, uh, uploaded to the server. So I asked this question last year. I was like, I had no idea, like, what's the max number of environments you could create? Because what I wanted to do, and the answer is basically, like, probably a lot. Um, I'd never tested it. But probably a lot was good enough for me. So we've been using Thor SEM to version our cookbooks. Why don't we version our servers, too? So this is a snippet of code where Thor SEM version is basically creating a tag release for the production uh, deploy. We then have some code that will convert the Burks file locks, uh, the solve basically, into an environment file that we then create and upload to the server. So this is a bit of old code. It's for Burks 2, and it doesn't even include the lock stuff. But it just kind of gives you the gist if you're you know, Ruby-minded of basically like create an environment object, use the Burks libraries to solve, get the dependencies, shove them into an environment, and then write it to a file. What's awesome about this is that we can see every tag. Every tag in the Chef repo is like what that version on the Chef server environment is. So you don't have to have access to the Chef server to know what versions are out there. 
because it's all in Git. So what does this actually look like? Because this might seem weird, and it totally is. But So we basically have every node lives in an environment. And uh, the environment in this case is the real environment it lives in is something called 1.4 latest. It's this concept of a moving release. Thor SEM can do pre-release and patch and minor. It follows the Semver format. Uh, the default option for deployment to production is a no-op, right? We don't want changes to just randomly go out there. You want to be purposeful with it. So what does that mean? So you make a commit, deploy my MyFace cookbook 103, and as you notice, Jenkins spit out an alpha release. So OK, I want app 2 to test uh, that uh, environment, that cookbook. So I flip that node. John Cowie wrote a great tool about uh, flipping nodes. Uh, they flip. We flip it over to there, do another commit, overwrites one for latest. We flip the node back. And if we want to do a bigger release, like a major, we create a 1.5. And uh, same thing, flip the node over there. Good to go. So I'm running short on time, so I'm going to like fly through pretty much all this. We, we, we basically version our data bags, which is either awesome or insane. And if you want to know more, find me after, and I'm happy to talk about it. So basically, we version our data bags crazy because data bags are global objects, and global objects are scary. So we don't do that. So I'm going to fly through all this stuff because I want to get to the, basically the premise of the talk is that it's flexibility, right? We use Chef because it's flexible. We use Chef that allows us the flexibility to create a workflow like this for our very specific environment. So that's the point. The tool does not dictate your infrastructure. It's the other way around. Um, so we're all at different points in this line. We're all at different stages of improvement along. You know, what we have today is definitely not perfect in any stretch of the imagination. It's a massive improvement where we were at. Uh, and a communication, every, all the good things have happened because of it. And I don't think it will ever be perfect, because that's the thing that drives me to want to make it better. Um, every place I go, I'm like, you know, people are like, oh, we've got this great workflow, and we'll look at it. And, and eventually, you just kind of look at those things and go, no, we can always make it better, right? You can always improve upon that stuff. So my biggest thing is that it's totally OK to be a special snowflake, right? Your environment is a special snowflake. You have all of these organizational biases and company culture, your unique requirements and operational you know, expertise um, that it is how your environment gets created and managed. So I think people might disagree with me, but I, I don't think there's a right or a wrong way to use this tool or, or many of these types of tools, because there's just like your way to use it. So I say you should embrace your special snowflake uniqueness and, and be a special snowflake. So thank you very much. Uh, you can find me on, like I said, Twitter or email or whatever. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs>